We are half an hour away from the opening bell. Hong Kong, Shanghai, and Shenzhen. Happy Monday morning. You're watching the China Show. I'm David Ingles with Yvonne Man. Our top stories this morning: Asian stocks gaining to start the week. Focus on corporate earnings and eco data as traders seek insight into the direction of central bank policy. Tesla slashing prices amid slumping sales and swelling inventory as Elon Musk puts off his India trip to deal with a company in chaos. And a U.S. bill to force a sale or ban of TikTok said to become law within days after. Bipartisan support in the House of Representatives. Well, happy Monday! Looks like we're seeing a slight sort of bid across these risk assets here today. In fact, U.S. futures punching higher or coming off some of the highs in the Asia session. But certainly that goes to show some of these Middle East concerns that we saw on Friday that really weighed on Asia seems to be fading uh, on this Monday morning. You're seeing at least when it comes to equities, the ASX 200 is what things are charging ahead. We're up 1.2 uh, percent in Sydney here this morning. Treasury yields are slightly higher here with a U.S. 10-year yield at 4.6 percent. But mind you, there's going to be a big week, a pretty tricky one for bond investors in particular when it comes to these bond auctions this week. I think it's a record $183 billion combined of two, five, and seven-year notes. So, you know, is 2% uh, well, two-year yield, is 5% coupon for the two-year yield possible? We haven't seen that in about a decade or so. That certainly is one thing we're watching as we try to continue this recalibration of the Fed and dealing with this sort of higher for longer narrative across these markets. Brent markets are slightly lower here this morning when it comes to Brent. We're at 86 bucks here right now. Copper, though, 80,000 and more on some of these Shanghai futures right now. You take a look at that. That brings us back to 18-year highs for copper here this morning. 154 for dollar yen. Of course, keep in mind, BOJ happens end of the week. Week as well. We're watching that Pegatron stock as well. There's been talks that Tata could be in discussions to buy out the Pegatron iPhone operations as well. Something to watch throughout the supply chain. We'll take a look at what it comes to the Golden Dragon Index and what happened on Friday. Certainly, it doesn't really tell us too much about what's going to go on, but we did see shares to actually fall some 1% in the tech space. We talk about the MAG7 reporting this week. It's all about tech, whether earnings can continue or at least bring these U.S. stocks back uh, out of its sort of underperformance of late, right? You talk about, you know, you, the S&P, I think, just had the worst week that we've seen, uh, at least the Nasdaq, since 2022. AVD futures are doing this year right now. We're down about a fifth of 1%. Chinese one-year yields are watching. We're basically back to those 2022 levels now and sub-170, 225, your 10-year yield. And dollar China, 725.47. We got that LPR coming up in just a few minutes' time. We'll see if there's anything that the banks are going to do, probably unlikely given that MLF was unchanged this month, Dave. Yeah, and I think the talk right now is, you know, the window for China to move on the MLF, for example, is maybe when the ECB moves. We could talk about that in a moment. But uh, to Yvonne's point, we're looking at those loan prime rates in about 10 or so minutes from now. Uh, we just talked about the 10-year yield at 225. The one-year yield is actually flirting with the lowest level going back to 2022. So just below that takes us all the way back to 2020 uh, levels. EV stocks very much in focus on the back of news out of Tesla, uh, the Model 3 there, of course, and the, and the price cuts uh, that we're seeing there. Uh, in terms of just moving averages, yeah, your 50-day, perhaps more relevant today is the 200 moving day average on the Shanghai Composite and also the 50-day on the Hang Seng China Index, not on your screens. We're also getting some data coming through out of Macau today. Keep that in mind. Earnings in China, China Mobile's coming out today along with others. Poli, we'll get to that in a moment. But all that being said, uh, as Yvonne was talking about here, it's really be it's a really big earnings week uh, on, on, on in, in the U.S. markets on the S&P 500, and certainly could not come maybe at a more opportune time given what we're seeing as far as price. Certainly, the downtrend, as you can see, that uptrend has been snapped for now. Uh, what's also worth noting when you look at the chart: the 14-day RSI. We're now at the lowest level here, weakest momentum in U.S. markets going back to about October. So do we get a pick-me-up from someone whose earnings coming through? NVIDIA, of course, fell 10% on Friday. Futures are pointing slightly higher today. And, of course, we have to talk about the NASDAQ, too, Yvonne, and really where we go from here. We're down 7% from the peak. How far down do we go? We'll get these earnings, of course, this week coming through. Important week.
Yep, certainly that's one to watch here after what it was a pretty bad week when it comes to risk assets last week. Let's bring in our MLI strategist, Mark Cranfield, now. And the question of the day is quite interesting, too, Mark. When you talk about the tech sector, we, we were come off the peaks, right, uh, when it comes to U.S. stocks. How important are these MAG7 earnings to really justify whether this U.S. rally can continue? Um, enormous. I don't, I don't think you can under-prepare the, the quantity of this week at all, really. And as David said, even before this week of earnings gets started, NVIDIA has already had a 10% drop in one day. Now, the, the importance of that is really looking at the retail sector, and that probably makes it a little bit scary for the institutional investors. So NVIDIA has become the most held stock, the most traded stock by the retail sector in the United States. And we know how powerful they can be. Talk about the tail wagging the dog. They've become a major influence in the U.S. equity market, particularly since the pandemic. Now, why people should really be concerned is because before NVIDIA was the number one stock in the retail space, it was Tesla. And look what's happened to Tesla over the past year. It's just gone down and down, and the headwinds just seem to be coming. So even before the, the major companies start announcing the results this week, which is not NVIDIA, by the way, theirs is slightly later in the month, we've already seen one of the most important stocks collapse before we get started. So you cannot say that this is, this is a huge week. If we get through this week unscathed, it could well be a turning point. Everybody will think it's blue skies ahead. But if not, this might just be the beginning of a very bad period for tech stocks. Yeah, Mark, I was going to ask you because it's certainly, you know, this, this, this constant debate you know, and what's more important for stocks? Is it earnings or the inflation story? And certainly with the Fed conversation taking place, three weeks of losses on global stocks, would you now be able to say, obviously, let's see what happens this week, will earnings be the key driver for equity markets from here, at least U.S. markets? Earnings are, are far more important over a medium-term period for the equity market. The inflation story is a little bit of a nuisance, but what it really just means is that the Federal Reserve are going to delay interest rate cuts. They're not going to raise rates. No matter, there are, there are one or two people have, have put the notion out there that the Fed may need to, to raise interest rates again, and we've seen yields back up slightly. That is such a high bar that traders can pretty much ignore it, particularly in the equity space. They're not going to be too worried whether interest rates go up 25 basis points or down 25 basis points. Rates, from their point of view, are around 5%. They have factored that in. The U.S. economy is doing very nicely. It comes down to earnings. Are the individual companies really living up to the promise? Because some of these stocks are priced for perfection. And so any little wobble, you can see what happened to a Taiwan Semiconductor last week. That was a stock that had been on a rampage. And yet even a slightly doubtful outlook and the stock plummets. So you can see you, got to, you have to come in with earnings that not only meet, but your outlook has to be very positive as well. Otherwise, investors will, will hammer you. Mark, I want to switch to the bond market, given all these big auctions coming up on the short end of the curve for Treasuries this week. You know, there, there's the flat, the possibility of a, of a 5% coupon on the two-year yield. It, it, how likely is that? And how much, you know, is 5% really that magic number to really kind of draw more bond investors in to buy? Um, it's certainly an important number, but it is probably just within the, the context of the overall yield curve. If you look at where we get, we're getting some of the inversion is coming out, probably more significant is whether or not this auction actually steers the market towards a flat curve where the long end of the yields get pushed up further relative to the short end. Really, the next, the next really big trade for bond investors is whether or not they can afford to be more negative on 10, 30 years compared to the two-year sector. Otherwise, we're really just chopping around in the kind of range we've seen for some time. This is a huge auction week. There's a lot of bonds to digest for everybody. But traders are pretty good at pricing that in before the sales actually come through. So we'll probably get to the point where we absorb that auction numbers. We may well see the, the two-year go above 5%. That's quite possible. But whether it goes slightly above or not is not really the big trade. The big trade is whether the curve can steepen and whether it can sustain that. A lot of people have been burnt already going in too early on the steepening play.
Uh, ab ab absolutely. Uh, Mark, you've been writing about, and just to pivot to China, you've been writing about the Chinese equity market, the outlook for this week, and how perhaps uh, the CSI 300 might find it difficult to shift into a higher rate. Just take us through your thinking there. Yeah, you've got a lot of negatives piling up here. Again, the, the risk of sanctions is getting broader and broader as we get into the U.S. election cycle. But it's not just for America. Of course, the Europeans are looking at various parts of the Chinese economy as well. And some of these drivers, things like electric vehicles, are fundamental to the outlook for Chinese stocks. And then you've got this, you've got this false positive from the yuan. It looks as though the yuan is a strong currency. When you look at the yuan basket, it's actually been rallying pretty strongly for the past couple of months. Really what's happened there is that by keeping dollar yuan in a tight range, the yuan has strengthened against most other currencies because the US dollar has been pushing them weaker. Well, how much longer can the PBOC really afford to keep dollar yuan in such a small range when the dollar yen is getting close to 155? If this week's Bank of Japan meeting is a non-event and dollar yen really goes much higher, it's only a matter of time before the Chinese authorities have to allow room for the yuan to weaken against the US dollar. And that's going to be a negative across the board for Chinese stocks. Mark, thank you. Mark Cranfield there, MLive strategist for us. Maybe we have the perfect guest uh, with Becky Leo joining us later on in the show to talk us really how much the, well, how much scope the PBOC might really have uh, to keep this uh, fixing frozen at these levels. Mark also talked about EVs and how that's really contingent on what's been happening to this market and certainly part and parcel to that story today is Tesla uh, spending the weekend in the big news just in the slightest chance that you missed it, slashing prices for its cars across the US, in Europe and in China. It's after disappointing first quarter sales. Uh, really leading to the swelling in inventory ahead, of course, of earnings coming through as well. Let's begin Peter Verko, our Global Business Asia editor. He's in Sydney for us. Peter, uh, what do we know about these price cuts? Yeah, they were pretty sweeping price cuts across the US mm -hmm. and China, the Tesla's two key markets, and also some price cuts in Europe. Uh, the, started off in, in the US with the, the price of the Model Y and the Model 3 coming down. Uh, in China, they slashed the price of the revamped version of the Model 3 and across the entire lineup. Um, it looks like the Model Y is now the cheapest it's ever been in China. Uh, and then that was followed late on Sunday in Asia time by discounts on what Tesla calls full self-driving in America. That package is now down to $8,000. Uh, it was originally $12,000. And, and clearly Tesla are trying to make a really big push on getting more people to take up yeah, what they call full self-driving or autopilot. We know that it's not quite there yet. It still needs constant supervision. But Elon Musk has previously said that Tesla really needs to nail autonomous driving um, to, no to be more than just another car company and really to justify the lofty market valuation that it has. And Peter, I mean, just broadly speaking, this is, a, you know, the Tesla stocks down more than 40 percent this year. It's really kind of detached itself from this magnificent seven story. And, you know, Elon Musk also canceling his trip to India now to deal with sort of the chaos. I mean, what, what, what does it need to do to really turn the ship around now? Yeah, well, I think we've got the Tesla first quarter earnings on Tuesday U.S. time and the earnings call. And I think that's really taken on great significance now given the events that we saw last week everything you know it started off with the, those swinging job cuts 10 percent of their global workforce uh, we had a cyber truck recall uh, on on friday and then obviously the weekend developments and musk uh late yesterday uh, in, in a last minute move cancelled a planned trip to india this week citing his heavy obligations at Tesla. Uh, so obviously there's going to be a lot of focus on this earnings call, uh, more than we've previously seen. And I think what investors and analysts are really looking for now is some clarity on what Tesla's strategy is going to be moving forward. They seem to have uh, ditched plans for a cheaper mass market car around the $25,000 mark and have gone what Elon Musk, you know, rather colourfully called balls to the wall on autonomous driving. Peter, thank you. Peter Verko there, our Global Business Asia editor, joining us out of Sydney. It's interesting, right, Dave, when you talk about 
the, the the loss of fortunes for Tesla. I mean, you could see it when just the, the market cap that's just basically evaporated this year. Mm. And, and Exxon Mobil actually is now oversee, oh. overshadowed them in terms of mar uh, Tesla, in terms of over, uh, market cap now, I should say, mm. um, which goes to show, right, when you have oil prices coming up, that certainly is helping the likes of Exxon. But Tesla is certainly in, in some sort of downshift gear. I don't even know how to describe it mm. uh, in car terms. Mm. But, you know, what can they do this week? You know, they're saying this, this week is kind of a make it or break it moment, really, for Tesla. Yeah, well, we'll see what the earnings coming through as well. I put a, a question on, on, on X over the weekend. Would you buy Twitter at these levels? Uh, not Twitter, Tesla at these levels, 50% down, and not a single response, and obviously it's not a sample size of a billion, <laughs> said no. There's a lot of downside momentum in the stock. Uh, breaking news out of China right now, the PBOC keeping, well, for one, keeping the yuan daily fix steady. The, number two is one in five-year loan prime rates unchanged as expected at 3.45% on the one and 3.95% on the other fix on your screens. Also, your RMB 725 35 against the US dollar. Right, um, just ahead, in fact, we'll digest, we'll unpack this and what this means for rates and rate strategy in China. Standard Chartered comes, up, comes along. Becky Liu, head of China Macro Strategy, joins us later this hour. Candidate to the Open of Trade, first one of the week, 14 minutes away. You're watching The China Show. Good morning. I just want to recap just now the breaking news of that China LPR. So no change for the one year or five year here and was, was no surprise. Everyone expected this here today and a fifth day of that fixing set at 710 this morning. You're still seeing a little bit of weakness when it comes to dollar China, or at least for the, the renminbi here this morning. Uh, and this is what futures are looking like. Turning a little bit more positive now. So we'll see how this all plays out on this Monday morning. Let's bring in our guest, Becky Liu, head of China macro strategy at Standard Chartered Bank. There's been this renewed focus on currencies stability now from policymakers. How long is that going to last and is it really going to take precedence over monetary easing? Uh, we believe that would be one of the key factors. So the first uh, possible timing for the PBOC to cut the MLF rate uh, next, uh, the, the, the next time will be in June, uh, but more likely they might have to dis uh, delay that into the third quarter. So currency uh, stability takes very high priority this year in our view. This is under the backdrop of a global election year, and we already started to see protectionism, uh, trade barrier measures uh, being uh, 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 rolled out, and, and therefore a Maintaining FX stability would be one key consideration when China making economic policies this year. Right, and the what do you think the short-term direction of the exchange rates will be? Uh, we believe they have to move the fixing slightly further higher mm -hmm. to allow spot to move higher uh, a bit further. Because once spot hits the weak band, uh, mm -hmm. which is implied by the fixing yeah. of like 2% from the fixing, they only have two, uh, three options. One is to step up intervention of the domestic uh, dollar CNY spot. Uh, second is to move fixing a bit higher. If they don't do both, then the consequence is that trading might stop. Because onshore trading system works differently. If you put a order at the CFAT system at the weak band, if nobody is on the other side to take the other trade, there's no trade. So we might even see a decline of volume like what we have seen last uh, September and October. So does that mean the depreciation pressure will continue? I'm just wondering because we, our Mark Cranville was just saying, right? How long can the BBOC afford to keep those fixings pretty much frozen when dollar yen's at 154 right now? There's a bit of a false narrative that it's stronger against most of its peers. Uh, exactly. Uh, what PBOC have been doing since late last year is keep waiting for the dollar to weaken. But the current scenario, especially when the ECB is likely to be cutting ahead of the Fed, suggests that dollar might stay strong for longer. And therefore, they are slightly changing their strategy indeed. Mm -hmm. So we believe they will indeed need to move the fixing a bit higher, especially during the second quarter when seasonal demand for FX is already rising. Mm. That sounds like if I'm a hedge fund, my trade is to short the currency. <laughs> Exactly. We feel that almost everyone are uh, shorting a uh, dollar CNH in, uh, in, in the uh, outright forward uh, mm -hmm. curve. And therefore, uh, since last week, I believe all the questions that we, be, uh, we, we receive would be people fearing there is a sudden loosening of the CNH liquidity condition offshore, mm -hmm. which would be putting such trades at risk. So from our perspective, we feel that the PBOC are getting more and more experience in, uh, in managing all these effects. And whenever they feel there's a strong consensus 
influence us trade, they could be doing the opposite. So we do believe they need to maintain relatively strong intervention in the short term, but also allow spot to move higher as the fixing. Hmm. How should we look at capital outflows now? Is that a big concern or is that likely to ramp up? Uh, that is a smaller concern compared with last year. There are a number of reasons. The first reason is that the bulk of the FDI outflow last year was due to retained earnings over the last decade. But uh, as of now, the bulk of those outflows are done. So what they will continue to do would be the current earnings, um, uh, the current revenue that they are still generating from China. But uh, what we observe is that nobody is really like winding down the business uh, or anything like that. It's basically just because of interest rate differential, they would like to repatriate their earnings from China to overseas market. And uh, another pillar is obviously security investment. We have already seen seven months of consecutive foreign inflows back to China's domestic bond market yeah. for an amount that has exceeded uh, uh, 110 billion US dollar already. Wow. And that is due to arbitrage, which could be partly created by the PBOC's FX intervention activities. Right. More with Becky Liu. She'll be rejoining us in about 10 or so minutes, head of China Macro Strategy at Standard Chartered Bank. Features are pointing higher quarter 1%. Hang Seng, 200 points to the upside. A full preview of your trading day in a couple of minutes. Just ahead, this is Bloomberg. Right. Uh, what, a, what wonders uh, a weekend in between can do when you look at these markets. We're coming off the worst week for global equities. I think going back couple of weeks, three weeks? Yeah. I'm probably mistaken with that. It was a bad week, yes, last week. But we're headed into the open today, gains of just over 1%, as you can see here in Hong Kong. It just looks like everyone just got a, a good weekend of sleep and came back and with you know, cooler heads. And, you know, we've backed off in some of the Middle East tensions. And certainly, yeah. no uh, we talk about how crucial this week has been, it will be, when it comes to tech earnings. That certainly is one that we need to contend with. So in terms of analyst actions, you have Hong Kong Exchange rate a new ad at Hua Chang, Ju Maljo. We're watching the alcohol space here, cut to equal weight at Morgan Stanley. And Chongqing Brewery rate a new ad at Sucho Securities. Yeah, we're looking at some of these EV stocks as well. But Tesla, of course, uh, on the weekend announcing sweeping price cuts and some of the some of the EV plays, of course, uh, seeing some weakness. Not all of them, of course, x Punk's called higher, as well as Geely. Also looking at the race out of tech space on the back of the big drop in tech. Uh, rebound today with a big drop on Friday, so it's looking good. It's looking well. The Open, three minutes away. This is The China Show. Welcome back. You're watching The China Show. We're coming down the open of markets, and we're certainly seeing a pretty happy Monday here. You take a look at the Hang Seng and the pre-market. We're up 1%. Futures are pointing higher. So it seems like we've kind of recovered a little bit from the really the fear that we saw on Friday across these Middle East tensions and stuff. The fact that you know, it really hasn't escalated over the weekend, that certainly is a good sign that maybe we can push away that, that story for now and really focus on earnings and, of course, the fundamentals. We got MAG7 earnings also. We got that PC inflation gauge, the Fed's preferred gauge coming up later on this week as well, Dave. Yeah, lots to, at least we have some mind space right now to look at the, uh, those things as well. Now, when you look at the open, a couple of things, right? 50-day uh, moving average and focus on the Hang Seng China Index, Shanghai Composite is at 200-day moving average. We're looking at EVs, which we'll talk about in a moment, because we're also getting word that Li Auto is also cutting prices as well. Uh, slightly lower in the CSI 300. Where are we on to 10-year yield? Is at 225 as well. Fixing was quite steady at 710. Uh, yet again for another day as well. A quick glance at some of your small caps. Of course, we had a rally almost into the weekend late last week. Uh, flip the boards, please, if we can. And while you look at that, of course, and just to mention as well, here's some of your commodities. Copper is in focus here. We're trading at 80,000 RMB for the first time. Just about, I would say on record, just because the last time we were at 80,000 was back in 2006, but the exchange rate at that time was also much higher. So at these levels, copper prices, yep, quite expensive. Okay, um, BYD and some of the EV plays in focus, 1.3, 1.7%. Lee Auto, uh, we should be getting that also on your screens on the back of some of these price cuts as well. Of course, the other one was the Tesla story, cutting their revamp Model 3, of course, US, Europe, and also some of their prices in China. Um, speaking of earnings coming through, through just a look at some of the earnings uh, that are well, some companies that are set to report results today. So China Mobile, of course, big one in telco. And of course, when you look at real estate and property, poly real estate leads uh, those, uh, those reporting today. So yeah, Yvonne, we'll leave it there for now. 
All right, yeah, Lee Auto Shares, as you mentioned, were actually down okay. some 4% on the back of those price cuts wow. as well. Still with us is Becky Liu, head of China Macro Strategy at Stanchart Bay. She's still with us. Uh, we talked about that unchanged in the LPR this morning. Well, what's going to be that window for cuts now? Uh, since the first quarter GDP came out better than expected and there are some signs that the Chinese economy is uh, bottoming out at least uh, briefly in, in the foreseeable future that uh, we uh, do feel that uh, the authorities feel some sort of relief and um, it feels to us that the pressure of acting immediately has declined. Mm -hmm. So the first possible time for them to cut the MLF and therefore the LPR would be in June but yeah. the higher probability is probably they need to delay that into the second half uh, of this year. We still see some, uh, the window for LPR cuts opening, especially for the back end of the CAF. Uh, we believe the five year needs to be cut more than the one year. Mm -hmm. uh, particularly, we still see some pressure in the real estate sector. Okay, because that's the mortgage, the one tied to mortgages as well. What does it do for if we do get that cut? I mean, the, the, the margins for these banks are already under pressure substantially. Do we get an asymmetric deposit rate cut, for example? Uh, we believe we will see that fairly soon. Um, mm. So we are already seeing the uh, state media hinting uh, of uh, such a move this morning, and we believe uh, there's a very high probability for them to be guiding over all conventional uh, deposit rates mm. lower in, in the current quarter. Uh, particularly, they might again cut the back end of the curve more than the front end, like what they have done last time. For example, the last time they lower the back end, like the three to five year deposit rate by 50 to 60 basis point. On the front end, it's either unchanged or down only 10 basis point. We believe they will continue to do so in order to safeguard the banking sector's margin and making more room for uh, the cut of loan rates in the future. Does that mean CGB yields can, can head lower or you think the downside is pretty limited at this point? Um, in the short term, we think the downside is more limited, given they are already at his, uh, historical low level. We are already seeing some um, stability of growth, uh, some uh, possible small rebound of, of inflation. But in the medium to long term, if we talk about quarters ahead, we still see China rates as a low of a longer story. Hmm. I mean, you've been watching inflation, and you mentioned inflation as well. What's the best case for consumer price inflation this year? Uh, well, we believe that um, uh, one of the best cases, at least for month-on-month -month inflation, returning to the positive territory. Mm. Uh, what we have observed last year is that the bulk of these uh, deflationary pressure actually comes from food. Uh, and on the other hand, services inflation failed to pick up, but they were uh, indeed still positive. So with pork, a pork price already at such a low level and everything goes in cycle, we believe that that cycle might be turning around later uh, this year and it's going to bring CPI inflation gradually uh, higher back to around 1% by the end of this year. But PPI inflation could still stay negative throughout mm -hmm. the entire year, partly because of the overcapacity issue. Uh, we, I don't think we talked about your RMB forecast. I mean, what, what has anything changed? Do you think we need to talk about a, a, a wider range now for dollar China? A uh, higher range. A higher range yeah. and wider. We, we, we are still holding dollar CM uh, Y forecast at 7.30 by the end of the second quarter. Uh, by the end of this year, we are now putting that at 7.0. But with the possibility for the Fed to be staying higher for longer in terms of the rate, uh, that the risk is for uh, dollar CM Y to be ending this year slightly higher mm. uh, than what we are seeing today. Yeah, I was going to ask you how, how important important is the Fed to that seven forecast that you have? Uh, it's quite important uh, <laughs> indeed. Uh, so if dollar continue to strengthen, especially there are signs building up that other DM central banks might be cutting ahead of the Fed, mm. then uh, the dollar might stay stronger uh, for longer and that would be uh, not a very good case for the CNY. Uh, as what we have already seen is that it continued to appreciate against the basket because other currencies, especially regional EM currencies, are depreciating faster than the, than the CNY. But from dollar CNY's perspective, it remains very very sticky, close to the uh, weekend, uh, weekend uh, as implied by the fixing. Does that lead to something, I mean, last week we were discussing maybe a possible mini plaza accord. You know, do you, do you see something like that? And what, what would that do to renminbi in some way? Uh, we believe the possibility remains uh, not very high okay. uh, at this stage. There are still a lot of tools that the PBOC could use in order to counter the weakness. And the calculus from our perspective is that it, it's exactly because of the election year. So this is the most vulnerable moment. Mm -hmm. And um, if somebody is hiking tariff this year, there's simply no political and geopolitical environment in the next five to ten years for any foreign politician to bring that tariff down yeah. again. So as well, just keeping the 
policy and why relatively strong to stop provoking China's trade partners from imposing a more aggressive reaction yeah. would be the calculus at the moment. So, so we, be, we don't believe they will allow the currency to weaken substantially in order to gain export competitiveness. What else are you tracking? Anything? <laughs> we're, we're all yours, <laughs> apart from what, what we've are we mentioned. What are we not talking so, about? Yeah. Well, we think one of the interesting uh, issues is uh, still the overcapacity issue that has been mm. discussed a lot. Uh, so if we look at the industrial utilization ratio, it actually went down further in the mm. first quarter. And uh, very notably is the auto sector. Mm. Uh, now people feel Chinese cars are very competitive. But on mm. the other hand, if you look at the utilization ratio, it came down by 12 points from a quarter ago. Mm. And the current utilization is only around around 65%. So that's fairly low. So from our perspective, that's a reflection of China's new um, industrial policy, uh, a huge focus on the manufacturing sector. But on the other hand, that would also uh, be an important back, uh, backdrop leading to continued divergence of inflation between China and the rest of the world. Mm -hmm. I'm wondering with, you know, the China looking to export more to the world again, and it feels like we're back to 2004, 2005. Um, are you rethinking some of the forecasts and trade flows, for example? Are we looking at you know another round of a, a spike in the trade surplus, for example, with some countries? And how does it affect the exchange rate as well, demand too? Yeah. In, in, in the short term, we actually feel that trade surplus is a structural issue. Because on one hand, China is localizing everything, especially localizing all the interim products, manufacturing products, leading to China's import mix is more and more skewed towards uh, just basic material, raw material, and therefore leading to a decline or very weak growth of import. But on the other hand, because of price difference, um, the export goods are still relatively uh, relatively um, competitive. But at the same time, we also notice some of the medium to long term structural changes. Uh, all the Chinese corporates that we talked to in recent months are positioning to go overseas. Uh, one of the primary reasons is domestic demand is considered to be relatively weak and they want to be more and more dependent on external demand. So over time, when they build up overseas factories, overseas capacities, we might also see it uh, going to negatively impact China's export in the long term term. But uh, in, in the short term, nobody is ready to produce outside of China yet. So in the short term, we still see trade surplus uh, maintaining um, at a very high level. And that's one of the fundamental support to the CMY, but it's not yet um, uh, sufficient to alter the, uh, the entire trend. Becky, have a great week ahead. Yeah. Pleasure to speak with you. Fantastic. Becky Liu, head of China Macro Strategy at Standard Chartered Bank. Right. Let's talk about TikTok, shall we? Why not? Um, uh, a bill forcing TikTok's Chinese owner ByteDance to divest its ownership stake is uh, really on fast track to becoming law in the U.S. The legislation was included in a crucial aid package for Ukraine and Israel passed uh, by the House over the weekend. Let's begin uh, Peter Elstrom. He's with us out of Tokyo. He's our Asia uh, tech executive editor. Uh, Peter, on this TikTok ban, it, you know, we're moving closer and closer and closer to it. How close did we get uh, over the weekend? Yeah, this is moving quite fast. Uh, as you mentioned, um, uh, the TikTok legislation was wrapped into these aid packages that we're seeing for Ukraine and Israel that's got a lot of more, more momentum behind it. This effort to either ban TikTok or force it to be sold to an American buyer uh, has been debated for many, many years at this point. And now we're kind of rush, rushing towards what could be an endpoint uh, in the legislation, at least. Uh, so Congress is moving ahead with this effort to either uh, force uh, ByteDance, the parent company, to sell off TikTok or see it banned within the United States. That's a huge deal for ByteDance. It has 170 million users in the country. Uh, it's one of the forces in social media right now. It's certainly challenging uh, Facebook and Google in particular. So this is, a, this is a pretty serious threat. The company has said very clearly that it plans on fighting this measure in court. Uh, it's important to point out that right now, the company still has a year before it has to divest the business, the TikTok business. That's after the election, very importantly. But even after that, the company is planning on taking this battle to the courts. They're going to see if they can find it. They've, been, they've argued that uh, there's a First Amendment case here. This is free speech to be able to express yourself on TikTok, and the government should not be getting in the way of the effort to talk about this. Washington, as I'm sure you've heard, is uh, has been expressing concerns that this is a national security threat. Because TikTok is owned by a Chinese company, it may be influenced by the Chinese government either to manipulate the content on there or to track some of the data of the users on the platform. Again, 170 million users, it's a very big deal for the U.S. market. 
And Peter, what do we know about TikTok removing this executive that's been tasked with, with fending off these U.S. claims? Mm. Right, yeah, so Bloomberg News has reported that uh, TikTok is planning on removing the general counsel who has been leading the legal effort here. Uh, TikTok has pushed back on that. They said that it's not true at this point, but it is quite a controversial position. Uh, again, for years, the company ByteDance and TikTok uh, have been trying to persuade Washington politicians that they are not a threat. They've, uh, they've isolated the data from American users. They've given access to that to a number of companies like Oracle, and they've They've uh, tried to demonstrate that they will take care of users' privacy in these markets, but it hasn't been enough. Particularly of late, there's been a lot of momentum to move ahead with this idea that either ByteDance is going to have to sell this business or it's going to be banned in the U.S. Again, ByteDance has been pretty clear. They are not planning on selling the business. They're going to fight first. Even after that, they may decide to shut down the business in, in uh, the U.S. rather than sell it to somebody else and kind of lose the business forever. Given the volatility of American politics, you can imagine that this may come back and they may be able to get back into the market or turn the tide of public opinion in the U.S. Peter, thank you. Peter Elstrom, there, our Asia Tech Executive Editor, joining us in Tokyo. I uh, just want to check Lee Auto Shares here right now. It is uh, the worst stock on, on the HSI, just given what we heard, not just the Tesla story on price cuts, but Lee Auto also joining in on this price war right now. And you take a look at uh, what we've been seeing so far. Uh, some reports are saying that they've slashed that L9 series starting prices to just around 400,000 run them be now. So the stock down some 6%. We got plenty more ahead. This is Bloomberg. Well, Chinese President Xi Jinping has ordered the biggest reorganization of the nation's military since 2015. It's a move that will affect the force in charge of capabilities, including cyber warfare. For more, let's bring in our Jader China senior executive editor, John Liu. He's in Hong Kong this week. Uh, John's good to see you. Um, how significant is this reorganization? I think it says a lot about priorities uh, in this reorganization. They're elevating aerospace. They're elevating cyber. I think those are both areas where there has been intense competition. But I think with all things uh, military-wise, when it comes to China, there's much more we do not know than what we know. For example, the uh, strategic support force, which they are getting rid of in this move, uh, the gentleman who is running that group, he, he has not been seen in public for a long time. So th there's some questions about what happened to him. Obviously, this the context, the background here is we had the defense minister changed. We had lots of people in the military industrial complex uh, removed. And so there, there seems to be a lot of moving parts. But definitely this says aerospace, cyber. I think cyber especially, big, big important things for China. Uh, just to pivot to, so we're coming off uh, a trip from the U.S. Treasury Secretary. And next week, I think Antony Blinken is, mm -hmm. is set, to, uh, set to visit China. What, what are we watching out for? Any message that uh, we could uh, deduce from this point? So I think he's got a tricky sort of balancing act to, to do here. He wants to, on one hand, make sure that any uh, progress in stabilizing the ties is, yeah. uh, you know, further cemented uh, out of that meeting between Xi and Biden in San Francisco. But at the same time, there are a lot of concerns on the American side about Chinese support for Russia in the war uh, invasion of Ukraine. Uh, the, the key here is dual use technologies, things that can be used for tanks and missiles, but also for electronics and cars for the household. And so I think Secretary Blinken will be making that very clear. John, thank you. John Leo, our Greater China Senior Executive Editor with us here, of course, on set here in Hong Kong. Now, in other news, the U.S. House has passed this $95 billion aid package for Ukraine, Israel, and Taiwan over the weekend. To talk more about that, really what this means for a lot of these hotspots around the world. That's joined, we're joined uh, today by Ben Scott, Senior Advisor at the National Security College of the Australian National University. Uh, ben, a pleasure to have you on the show. On, let's start with Iran and certainly I events there from Friday. So Israel's responded to Iran's response. Iran's now said that it's case close as far as this specific issue is concerned. Uh, can we deem the specific front behind us for now, Ben? Uh, yes and no is the answer, I'm afraid. Uh, the fact that Iran is downplaying the latest Israeli attack uh, is a clear sign that Iran doesn't want further escalation at this point. 
But the underlying drivers of the conflict on both sides are there, still there and growing. And the, the main reason that Iran is downplaying the Israeli attack is that Iran doesn't want to escalate at this point. Iran doesn't want to bring it to a head precisely because Iran thinks that uh, strategic, strategic trends are working in its favor at the moment and it's, it's, it's content to let them continue and play out. Um, and that's on a number of levels. One is that Iran is closer to a nuclear breakout than it's ever been. Um, and also Iran's continuing to develop its partners and proxies throughout the region, their capabilities to threaten Israel down the track. And finally, the regional support for Iran's axis of resistance, as it terms it, is probably higher than it ever has ever been, higher than in 10 years. And that's continuing to grow. So all those things are in Iran's favor. And from Israel's side, Israel is not content for that, that situation to continue as it is, and is signal, signaling that it's more willing to take risk and it's less willing to put up with the risk of that capability growing. So it's, it's, it's want, it wants to change the rules of the game. It wants to mount more of these attacks. So it's going to so this sort of brinkmanship will continue, I'm afraid. Who do you think came out of this victorious, I mean, if you could call it that, I mean, mm -hmm. you know, who came out of this maybe stronger in this kind of direct mm -hmm. conflict between Iran and, and Israel now, Ben? Yeah, it's a great question. I mean, I think it's undeniable that Israel won this round. I mean, Israel had the first attack and the last attack. Israel inflicted real damage, um, both in killing some senior IRGC commanders in Damascus at the beginning and in, in mounting its attack uh, in Isfahan province uh, in Iran on 19th of April, at the same time signaling that it can probably do much more in Iran if it wants to. Um, at the same time, Israel suffered minimal damage. Um, it demonstrated the capability of its, uh, its Arrow 3 anti-missile defense system in particular, quite impressively. It demonstrated regional support for that, that, that counter-Iranian defensive move. Um, and it, it, so it, 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 more importantly, I think, and something that's often overlooked, is it successfully defied the United States. So the United States made clear, or President Biden made clear, they wanted Israel to take the win, and they didn't. They pushed it a bit further and got away with it. But in the longer term, as I was saying earlier, I think the regional trends are really against Israel. Hmm. I, I was about to ask you, because the optics, they're losing the PR, at least the PR and the optics war here, Ben, and they're certainly losing more support when you look at, when you take a toll globally almost week to week. How do you think this affects the options in the table now or for Netanyahu? Uh, I, I think Netanyahu has probably gained a little bit more um, personally by showing that he's able to stand up to the United States. That's something that matters uh, and something that he often claims mm -hmm. domestically. He has that ability. But otherwise, I don't think it, it, either he or Israel has any great options at the moment. So, I mean, I think they've reached the point of diminishing returns in Gaza. I don't think they have a, a real solution for the problem in Rafa. I think Hamas is probably going to stay in Gaza and stay with some sort of control in the end. So they don't, they don't really have a solution to that at this point. I mean, I'm one of those who continues to believe that a two-state solution is really the only answer. It's a long way off, but I, I think that's what we have to focus yeah. on. Ben, that's all the time we have, but thank you so much. Ben Scott there, Senior Advisor at the National Security College of Australian National University. Just checking some of these crude markets here right now, you continue to see that downtrend when it comes to oil prices and it really come off from what we saw from Friday as well. So we're back well below 90 bucks now from Brent at 86, just under 83 for WTI. Shanghai crude also down close to 2%. We've got plenty more ahead. This is Bloomberg. Right. Welcome back to shows. We're about 23 minutes into the session. So some of these, a pocket of the Chinese market is feeling that 10% drop from NVIDIA. AI-related stocks and names, as you can see, are down 4 to 8, in some cases 9, 10% here. Um, after the big drop, of course, biggest one in four years. Uh, earnings are further out there from NVIDIA. All that being said, though, it's a fairly crucial week here for tech earnings in the U.S. Yes, so the MAG7, right, we talked about, you know, the, is it, we need earnings and good earnings to yeah. justify or at least resume this U.S. equity rally, which basically has not done too well uh, when it comes to the S&P. Lee Auto, there you go, we're, we're at 5% loss.
losses here right now. Still the biggest loser on the board and the Hang Seng here on the back of those price cuts. So follow what we saw with Tesla over the weekend as well. And that certainly is roiling most of the EV sector here today with Great Wall Motors also falling close to 5%. Xpeng also down some 3%. Your China dashboards are looking like this here right now. So uh, for the most part, we're checking, you know, they're seeing some decent gains in Hong Kong. Take a look at that, 2%. Uh, and MSCI China. So offshore is still doing much better than onshore here today. We're pretty flat when it comes to Shanghai. It really is HS Tech that is fueling that trade this morning. And you have dollar China hovering around at 725. Letable. Right. Just ahead, we're talking the Chinese market, a deep dive with BNP, plus all three central banks with Allianz. This is Bloomberg. We are seeing a bit of recovery here when it comes to risk assets this morning. A look at the CSI 300, and you're seeing slight gains, about a third of 1%. It's really the hang on the bottom of your screen there that is outperforming here this morning. We're seeing 2% pop on shares there with HS Tech really driving that lead here this morning, Dave. And, of course, that LPR was unchanged, but we're focusing a lot on earnings and fundamentals, of course, this week. Yeah, finally, it's, it's you know, I was about to say it's quiet. So, like, you know, these markets have some time to simmer and us to focus on certainly other things as well. And it's probably a good thing, this is obviously anecdotal, it's probably a good thing that whenever you get days when news is quiet and uh, quite slow, you do get an uptick typically. Uh, risk assets, euro dollar, as you can see, that tends to lead and is a good indicator of risk appetite right now. Just about across the region, Nikkei all the way to Taiwan, up four tenths of one percent. Within Taiwan, there's a Pegatron story uh, on Tata. Uh, Nikkei 225, BOJ meeting, of course, at the end of this week as well. Uh, at your 10-year yield is at 90 basis points, almost 0.9%. Uh, all that being said, I think the key here is we are getting a pickup in risk assets yet again following the 3% drop that we had on fr uh, last week for global equity markets. We're better by 1%. Seven out of the 10 or 11 sectors are actually on the way up with the exception, I think, of energy, real estate, uh, and, uh, and to some extent, and of course the rest, consumer staples, IT and the like are leading these gains. Uh, S&P futures, big week. Of course, we talked about this. We'll talk more about it later. Big week for earnings in the U.S., um, so sink your teeth into that. A quarter one percent to the upside. We're back above 5,000 as far as that's concerned. But that being said, of course, it's also a good day. As Yvonne is pointing out here in Hong Kong, we're better by one and a half percent, depending on the benchmark you're looking at here. Yvonne. Yep. And, you know, we were talking a little more about this LPR and the unchanged decision from these banks, certainly because the MLF, we didn't see anything this month. But it's interesting, right? Is that window for cuts narrowing as well? We did hear from Becky Liu in the last hour from Stan Char, she's head of China Macro Strategy there, on what she thinks, right? What, how, when, how soon can China actually cut rates? Take a listen. We believe uh, there's a very high probability for them to be guiding overall conventional uh, deposit rates lower in, in the current quarter. Uh, particularly, they might again cut the back end of the curve more than the front end, like what they have done last time. For example, the last time they lowered the back end, like the three to five year deposit rate by 50 to 60 basis point. On the front end, it's either unchanged or down only 10 basis point. We believe they will continue to do so in order to safeguard the banking sector's margin and making more room for uh, the cut of loan rates. In the future. All right, let's bring in our Bloomberg Economics Chief Asia Economist Chang Shu. She's with us now. So LPR unchanged. Why hold? Not a surprise, right? Given that the uh, central bank didn't cut the policy rate, uh, we see at this point um, China's monetary easing process appears to have stalled. Um, the central bank's hands are tied by its renewed focus on the currency stability, and banks are not especially too, uh, keen to cut interest rates. And, uh, we, we see that the PBOC has been trying to keep the um, the um, currency quite stable uh, despite very intense um, depreciation pressures. Uh, for that reason, you might not be very keen to be the first uh, major central bank to cut the interest rates this year. So that's sort of the consideration from the central bank's point of view. But banks, um, the are concerns about margin squeeze, the uh, lending rate uh, has been coming down, but um, deposit rates, the, effect, the effective uh, cost of funding has not come down, so the margin has fallen to one of the lowest um, historically. So when? 
<laughs> yeah, um, we we do. Or what are the windows? What are the potential yeah. windows? Um, potential windows um, in June, uh, if the central bank follows the uh, ECB um, move, because the ECB indicated it's going to consider its monetary policy independent of the Fed okay. move and um, uh, in. in, in Drops a strong hint for June, and that uh, if that happens, it means the PBOC won't be the first central bank to cut an interest rate. So potentially, um, the PBOC can take the uh, June window. But an another possibility is the central bank will follow the Fed all the way. At this point, the uh, market is pricing a third quarter cut in in um, in the U.S. and um, potentially another one uh, in later uh, in the year but in the second part it does run the risk of China doesn't move at all in terms of um, policy rates because um, the f US yeah. activity uh, are very strong and uh, the um, no cut po scenario is a live possibility as, the, as far as the market is concerned. Does that put more importance into fiscal stimulus then? Yeah, it will have to be. At this point, the government is um, spending a lot on um, major big projects and, and the first couple months data, uh, fiscal data show that the government has been very proactive in supporting. But it does mean at, at this point monetary policy cannot actively support the economy. Uh, we've seen a lot of economists bump up on the street, bump up their forecast. Yeah. Remind us, what's what's the BE forecast right now for China? Uh, well, working on the forecast, okay. we are likely to um, raise our forecast as well. But this mainly reflects the higher than expected growth in the first quarter. Okay. We have not um, uh, upgraded our forecast for the um, remaining of the uh, three quarters. Okay. Yeah. I'm waiting with bated breath <laughs> for Changshu's email. <laughs> on that, right? Changshi or Bloomberg Economics there. Right, uh, just ahead, we will be taking a deep dive into these market reforms that have been announced uh, on the Chinese mainland. And BNP actually have been doing a lot of good work around this theme. And they'll be talking about opportunities and what they've seen and really where you place your money on the back of what seems to be a fairly consistent move as far as reforms are concerned. That conversation with Jason Louie comes up next. This is Bloomberg. All right, just to remind our viewers at this theme that's taking place, and thank you for the zoom in, back in Feb 2, 12 days before Valentine's Day, uh, this, uh, this pledge from authorities to stabilize these markets, trying to stop securities regulators, scrambled, of course, to sort of address investor panic over the new stock exchange rules, saying a surge in the listings is not ex expected as a result of the changes. And some of the look, of course, back in early February, has been mentioning this pledge to stabilize markets. And then you uh, think about almost seven weeks back already now, tighter scrutiny over IPOs and listed firms. You fast forward about a week or so, and then you have, of course, these fund inspections, for example. Maybe we can accelerate the pan a little bit. Thank you so much. And of course, uh, tighter stock market regulations, of course, was the more latest one here, too. Uh, wrap this thing um, for us right now. We're taking a deeper dive into this. Uh, this so-called what? This quant quake, wasn't it? Well, I mean, that was what kind of triggered maybe some of these sort of reforms or yeah. measures at least, yeah. right? Because of the volatility that we did get as well. So mm. certainly, you know, what have we learned so far? Let's get a kind of a sum up. I want to bring in our roundtable. Yeah. Uh, Jason Loy, head of APAC Equity and Derivative, mm. Derivative Strategy from BB Para, but also with us is our Asia stocks reporter, Charlotte Yang. Charlotte, I'll start with you. Of what we heard so far, how effective has it been? Yeah, so far I think investors um, really welcome this uh, capital market reform. You know, since actually since March, we have seen CSRC announcing a list of uh, measures that's targeting at improving the quality of listed companies, as well as um, strengthening scrutiny of new listings. And that those efforts really culminated in March. We had this once a decade capital uh, market reform plan coming out from the state cabinet, which is a higher level authority that indicates coordinations uh, along uh, different parts of the government. But more importantly, since then we've seen you no know, daily. Uh, 
actions from news headlines talking about how you know CSRC we're sending probes into securities firm. We're also having you know, targeting individuals who are suspected of insider trading. So I think so far what um, investors see is there's not only determination but also real actions in terms of enforcement of these plans to make China's capital market more competitive. Jason, you've, you've done some work on this, you and your team. Is this a big deal? Sure. I think uh, to Charlotte's point, there are actually some real action that is happening, which should provide a little bit more confidence about their commitment to this. I'll also divide the reform into two parts. There's a the part that's on the operational side, like, for example, insider trading, uh, restriction on some of the high-frequency trading. But there's also the other part about the quality of the market as well, uh, which is what we think the corporate governance reform in China is actually quietly taking shape that maybe some of the investors are not as uh, well aware. And what are people missing in that part, the corporate government side of things? I mean, how substantial is it compared to other markets that we see in Japan and Korea, for example? Now? Sure. Um, I think corporate governance in China historically is quite a challenge term because I think there is a natural skepticism about the governance themselves. But what is interesting is that after what we've seen happening to Japan over the past eight to ten years that the policymaker really successfully engineered a positive feedback loop between the companies and the investors and now I think trying to look at what happened to Japan and they're trying to see what elements can they take from that and I think the biggest part of that is actually dividend reform uh, which we're happy to talk a little bit more but that is something that is quite unusual in terms of having policymaker mandate a company to pay a certain threshold of dividend. Why not? Okay so is that the lowest hanging fruit here? Is that the, the initial win the early wins, more dividends and bigger payouts? Sure, I think that is based on the current set of policy. Yeah. That seems to be the one that they are most focused on with actually a quantitative uh, threshold. Um, that is actually the, one of the bigger differences between what China is trying to do on corporate governance versus perhaps Japan and Korea. And so if you look at some of the big companies, their payout ratio is still actually quite low. So we have profitable companies in China mm. across the state-owned enterprise as well as private enterprise. But very often, the smaller companies, they don't tend to pay dividend despite the fact that they're making good profit. And so the more immediate action plan seems to be linking the ability for the company to finance mm -hmm. versus their commitment to pay dividend. And that is trying to align the priorities uh, of the companies and the shareholder, which is something quite unusual uh, based on the previous uh, reform attempts. Mm -hmm. And there's another um, thing that really attracts attention is about revamping the listing standards, which earlier um, some investors worry about whether this plan is targeting uh, small caps. I wonder if you see that. Sure. Um, <clears throat> I would say that there's certainly some confusion or fear in the market uh, earlier last week uh, when some of the announcements mentioned that, oh, this small mid-cap company may be categorized under the so-called ST tag. Uh, and then the CRC come out and say, oh, that's not exactly the same way. Um, I would say going back to my earlier comment, if you look at the starting point, it is true that the small mid-cap companies are a little bit behind in terms of their dividend payment policy. And so perhaps there's more room for them to catch up. And in the meantime, the government is also putting pressure on it. So there's a little bit of that push and pull factor. In the near term, perhaps those small mid cap companies will feel a little bit more heat. I, I, I do agree with uh, Charlotte on that. But I don't think that is the original intent to delist all these companies. It's just that to give them more incentive uh, to kind of be in line with the broader market when it comes to dividend policy. And, and you're looking at the more upstream, midstream sort of basket. I mean, what, what is in that basket now that could be benefiting from these measures? Sure. Um, so I think this is a basket that we previously uh, mentioned about. We have these uh, subset of companies that are in energy, material, and industrials, which has done surprisingly well this year, partly due to domestic factor because of this kind of dividend payment reform, as well as the international factor that the fact that China is exporting quite a lot of the capital goods uh, externally. So the way we think about this is that this is a high quality basket where some of the domestic asset allocation may come in because of the high dividend yield and this kind of steady profit growth. Mm -hmm. And then on the other side, the valuation itself is also quite defensive. It's trading in line with the broader market, which we think is a nice combination of benefiting from the current macro scenario as well as the micro scenario of uh, corporate governance. Right. And this is also, I mean, not a lot of people r realize how hard it is to be able to list your stock in Shanghai, right? That, you know, the, the profitability requirements to get there. But I'm surprised right now that not a lot of people know about the, you know, being able to share, you know, being able to share those profits uh, to your shareholders. And I'm wondering, when do you think we enter the phase of is shaming a good way to describe it? Hmm. Conscience, for example, do we need to do sure. they need to regulate people to sure. to start giving out specific 
payouts? I think that's a great question. So uh, I'll probably compare the corporate governance reform attempt we've seen in Japan, Korea, and now in China, mm. because they actually share different elements of that. Mm. Uh, as with many policy, we need a push factor and a pull factor. And if you look at Japan, they seem to create this rather uh, nice equilibrium of push versus pull. For example, you have the stock exchange telling company they have to go above one times price to book. And on the other side, you have companies actually following through and really pay out dividends and buyback, and their shares get rewarded uh, by shareholders. So I think that's probably the more ideal scenario. But it took Japan eight to ten years to get to that point. Mm. And if we look at Korea, they seem to be focused more on the incentive at the moment. There are probably a few more follow through coming through. Uh, but in the case of China, they seem to focus more on the regulatory side first, and then perhaps with a few good examples, uh, then the investor will start rewarding companies by following these changes. And then we get to a more uh, nicer equilibrium. How do you think the market is going to react to these sort of measures? I mean, I, I, we would bring up a chart that kind of shows how it, you know, the market's fair when 2004 we heard the first round, then 2014, which eventually did lead to the stock connect and all that. And you see a, a substantial kind of bump up in, in stock price and, and, and really just m momentum. Are we likely to see the same this time around? I would say that this time around the setup is slightly different because if you look back at the previous two episodes, it's not just the stock market. They also have a combined policy from fiscal and from monetary and also the external environment is also quite different as well. So I would say that based on this particular article alone, uh, it's probably not enough to repeat those kind of very uh, surprising returns. We'll probably need to see more coordination across different ministries and you probably need to see more active support from both fiscal and monetary side in order to create this kind of combination for the equity market. Right. Th that chart is quite astounding, isn't it? Can we get that up again? <laughs> I have another question on that. I mean, you look at the Shanghai Composite going back to 2003, Jason, and you know, this looks like a frontier market index in some cases, right? So I guess the other question is, you know, 2006 to 2008, 2015 to 2016, what do regulators need to do to prevent booms and busts of this sort? If they want to create a more value-centric sure. market <clears throat> and push away the frenzy, no problem. Really, I think that's an yeah. excellent question, even including the choice of using the Shanghai Com Index, because the reason is because Shanghai is only half or two. One third, uh, depends on how you measure, mm. of the overall China market. So part of that battle is that we need to find a good uh, benchmark that actually represents the overall China market. So what you tend to see is that we may be looking at one or two indices that may not give us the whole picture. Right. And that is why part of the capital market reform is to ultimately identify the S&P 500 equivalent for China where both institutional investors and retail investors can be aware of where they can find these high quality companies which will provide a little bit more sustainability when it comes What's to that investment process. What's the closest benchmark right now to an S&P 500-esque? Yes. Uh, I would say that based on market cap selection, uh, you do have the uh, CSI 300 mm -hmm. because they have the similar market cap mm -hmm. uh, selection. But we also see new indices uh, that are popping up with a little bit more uh, sector uh, selection as well. So I think we are still in that process of going through various formats of index construction that can eventually arrive us at a better index for long-term investment proxies. Interesting. Another platform this document is to attract more long-term funds into the market. And this isn't new. You know, we've hearing authorities talking about this. I mean, since last year. So, what is? How do you think um, authorities can make this happen, especially at this point, which we really need more long-term funds to come into the market? Sure, that's a great question. I think uh, the CSRC chairman Wu Qing also acknowledged that in many of his uh, interviews, talking about we need both short-term and long-term, but the long-term capital is harder. Uh, the way we think about it is that this dividend reform is key because when we think about long-term investors, they typically look for two things, capital appreciation and cash flow generation. And so by having a more stable dividend, you may be able to attract uh, funds like pension and insurance. Because right now, the Chinese government bond yield is very, very low by historical standard. And yet, if you can identify companies that are paying you four to five stable dividends, that is actually a very attractive uh, value proposition for these uh, long-term capital. So if we're picking stocks, and I think you mentioned the BNP, up midstream upstream yeah. benchmark what is the most relevant valuation metric to look at right now to be able to decipher and filter out the winners and losers yeah, yeah. like undervalued stocks of no stocks problem. that might be 
no that problem. might benefit from this? Sure. I think there are two approaches here. Um, the basket that we just discussed is mm -hmm. the one that are existingly that are doing well, that the long-term capital may want to uh, kind of gravitate towards because they don't necessarily have the conviction to look at new things. So that's the first part. Mm -hmm. The second part is something more akin to what Japan has gone through, where company with low valuation or high profitability but low payout ratio that are being under pressure mm -hmm. to pay dividends. So for example, we've also identified a subset of company that fits into that role. And the good news is that these companies are reporting in the next few weeks. So I think one of the measurements is to see that these companies with reasonable profitability, are they now willing to increase their payout policies so that can generate more investor attention? Jason, great stuff as usual. Jason Lui there, head of APAC Equity and Derivative Strategy at PMB Barrett. But also want to thank Charlotte Young, our Asia stocks reporter. We got plenty more ahead. This is Bloomberg. Well, some of our top story here today is uh, what's going on in Tesla and really these price cuts that were announced over the weekend. Also, you know, because of the chaos that's happening in the company, Elon Musk has decided to postpone his trip to India, really blaming those delays on pressing issues at the car maker, which spent the weekend really cutting prices for its cars and driver assistance software. So that's ahead of earnings expected to confirm a first revenue decline in four years. Seems like the bad news keeps piling up. Yeah, 50% down in the share price, too. Uh, nice. To add on top of that, so Musk has also staked the company's future on next-gen self-driving vehicle concept called a robo-taxi. For more on today's big take, let's bring in our global business editor, Peter Verko, to talk us through this. Well, Peter, I guess let's start basic. What is going on <laughs> at Tesla? That is the great question. Um, it seems it's been a very chaotic week at Tesla, even by Elon Musk's standards. You know, it started last weekend with the job cuts that were announced and that went out in like a late night email uh, and, and they were deep job cuts as well 10 percent of the global workforce which is about 14,000 people uh, uh, during the last week we saw the recall of Cybertruck in America all almost 4,000 that had been delivered had to be recalled uh, the company is trying to reheat the 56 billion dollar compensation package that uh, Delaware court struck down in January, uh, we had the price cuts on the weekend across the US, China and Europe, uh, discounts to full self-driving, and then a last-minute move by Elon to cancel uh, a planned trip to India this week. Um, it's hard to sort of pull any kind of coherent thread or strategy out of that from what's going on. I think investors and strategists and basically anybody that's got an interest in Tesla is really going to be looking to this earnings call on Tuesday US time to get some sense of where the company is heading. Yeah, I mean, what, what do you think investors are looking for specifically from this week's earnings? I think Dan mm. Ives and Weeper said this is sort of a make or break it moment for Tesla this week. Yeah, well, we already know that the earnings are looking pretty ugly because we've seen that drop in deliveries in the first quarter and margins are clearly being crunched by the price cuts that have been going on for the best part of a year now. Um, three months ago on the earnings call, Musk was really talking up progress that Tesla had been making on what's known as Model 2 or their mass market EV that meant to be going, you know, have a $25,000 price point, compete with Toyota Corolla uh, and really open up Tesla to a mass market. And investors have been, you know, really keen for some for for, for that to to go forward. Uh, it seems from his announcement during the week that uh, they were now going uh, what he colourfully described as balls to the wall on automation uh, and moved to introduce a autonomous robo taxi by August. That this Model Two has been set aside, and I think investors really yeah. want some clarity on what's going on there. Peter, great stuff. Our global business editor, Peter Virgo, there joining us out of Sydney with the big take here this morning. We're taking a look at markets here, and certainly what has been outstanding is the tech sector. Look at Tencent. We rarely see moves like this. We're up some 5%. There's been news of maybe that Dungeon and Fighter mobile game mm. launching early than expected on May 21st. We got plenty more ahead. Copper also doing very well. This is Bloomberg. Japanese markets hit that lunch break. It's 11.29 a.m. over there. You take a look at how equity markets are doing much better, really, than what we saw on Friday. So it seems like 
you know, the nerves, we've kind of simmered a little bit, you know, just given the Middle East tensions there, didn't really see any escalation over the weekend, and certainly we're still tracking dollar-yen. We're still holding around those 154, close to 155 levels as well. So we'll see if intervention really is still something a risk in this market. But the topics is doing quite well. We're up some 1.3%. Dave. Yeah, um, big week, big week in Japan, of course, uh, central yeah. bank decision there, and of course, big week in Asia. As far as data, we have a rate decision as well here in the region to tell you about. We'll talk more about it in a moment, uh, Bank Indonesia. But all that being said, the rest of the region, it's risk on 1%. Uh, we're just keep in mind, we're coming off global equities and a drop of 3% last week on the all-country MCI index, which effectively was the worst one in quite a while. Most sectors are up. Uh, I'd be paying more attention to materials, for example, just given the run-up we're seeing right now, in fact, in copper prices, all right? Uh, copper futures, whether you look at the contract in Chicago, LME, the one in Shanghai is above 80,000 renminbi for the first time effectively ever, but last time 2006, so 18-year highs on copper. We're nearing 10,000 on the LME contract. Yep, and central banks in Asia this week are definitely in focus. We talked about the BOJ, right, that's happening. It was set to hold there, but looking for a way to guidance on what really, uh, you know, that normalization process could look like. BE still thinks there could be still two hikes along the path here for the rest of the year. Tokyo CPI precedes that, so that certainly makes things a little bit more complicated. But we're also checking out Bank Indonesia, right? So this would be interesting, right? That it, it, they could actually hike. So 25 basis points, just given the beating that the rupiah has had on this whole higher for longer scenario that the Fed seems to be laying out of late. So some CPI prices coming out of Australia as well, GDP numbers out of the U.S. But Friday is the key one, that PCE deflator, the Fed's preferred gauge. So the bond market is certainly on tender hooks on that. Yeah, after three weeks of losses on Treasury markets. Yeah, I mean, 60-40 didn't really do well last week, no. quite a, a, a Polak thing that got. Well, on, on Bank Indonesia, I just had a look at forecasts here. So you have 10 economists thinking that we will get a hike this week. Uh, you have about 21 or 22 think that they're going to stay and hold at 6%. Let's get the initial take, plus others, of course. Christian Tontono is with us here on set. Allianz Global Investors, APAC senior economist. Shall we start with Indonesia? <laughs> yeah, I think uh, market definitely there's a rising uh, voices that there could be a hike. I think for, for if I, you really force me to take a take a stance. I I'm think not forcing, probably. but you can. You're welcome to. <laughs> Do it. <laughs> they may probably, I, I think that they probably will stay a bit cautious and observe a little bit longer. Mm -hmm. You know, I think in, in one way, uh, real rates level in Indonesia uh, is, is not low, I put it that way, and then the, the situations in the U.S. is still relatively fluid. So whether they would really do the rate hike uh, route to really stabilize the rupiah or, to, uh, or, or pursue in some other fashions uh, is still debatable. But uh, we'll see how, how that goes, right? I, I could be wrong on that. Uh, but put it it's this way, right? I think what's going on in the U.S. in terms of the postponing of the uh, rate easing schedule is really putting uh, the pressure on the region. We originally think that Asian Central and probably could have room to start easing in the second half, plus starting in, in June or July. But then this all got pushed back. And as you mentioned, it's also BI, even there's talks about that they may, they may hike. And all this because of FX stability, right? As the U.S. rates probably staying higher and even probably may have potentials to to, to etch up even higher, oh, that no. which is like previously, right, three months earlier, we no one is talking about such scenarios. Mm -hmm. So uh, all this is really delaying the uh, easing uh, uh, schedule or momentum that we can see in Asia. Uh, I think this is not positive to support the growth in the regions or to support it for the currency or the uh, risky asset prices in the regions, but we have to grind through this. We'll really see how the sequential flows of the uh, US CPI that we'll see in the coming months, if it really continues to stay high, then I think that uh, it probably uh, is gonna be uh, seeing that uh, rates will, the US rate is gonna stay for a lot higher. Yeah. Does it matter if the ECB even the BOE have signaled that they could possibly cut before the Fed. We saw that with SMB, right? There's other yeah. DM central banks that are willing to front run the Fed and cut. Yep. Uh, for them, they are like the major currencies then possibly that they, they, they feel least of a pressure from, from a strong dollar. But we are in Asia, that we are part of the EM currencies, then I think it's more aware of that. Yeah. But really, if the uh, uh, ECB or the BOE really start cutting ahead of Fed, that's kind of like even strengthen the uh, U.S. exceptionalism that we are seeing, and the dollar is going to be stronger. 
Uh, and, uh, and that would not be positive for the uh, EM Asia, in my point of view, from an FX perspective. Yeah. Mm. Who might be able... To still in, cut? In EM Asia, yeah. Who might be mm. able to... You know, who needs to cut? Let's put it that way. Yeah. Who is China to needs cut? to cut, yeah. I think. Yeah. China definitely needs to cut, but then obviously is very measured. Yeah. Uh, and uh, maybe Thailand may be able to cut, to consider. But I still see that they probably will be more in an observance state at this time, mm. not to giving too much pressure on the currency. But in one way is that the Thailand's economy really needs some boost in terms of weaker rates and possibly weaker currency. But then uh, I think they will be still be taking a measured pace in, in, the, in the face of uh, uncertain uh, U.S. Uh, rate trajectory. Mm. Mm. It seems like we've been so obsessed with what the Fed's going to do, but there's still some... Mm a bit of a growth story here in the region. Exports, mm. for, for mm -hmm. example, have, mm -hmm. have recovered. Yeah. Do you think that that stronger dollar story could actually endanger that recovery in exports? Not really. Sometimes when you look at various research, the uh, correlations in terms of near-term FX fluctuations and exports actually is not that uh, strong and then I think it's really the uh, resilient demand in the DM world that is actually supportive of, of, of exports. So near term we really see better than expected exports number. We see this in China and some other economies. Mm. I think that could help in, in, in giving some uh, growth momentum in the region uh, but uh, I think the domestic demand side story for regions is important uh, and as the post-COVID reopening uh, recovery momentum risk gradually vain, right, in most part of Asia, uh, actually an easier monetary conditions actually should help. And we are just waiting uh, for the U.S. to start to ease for the rest of the regions to be able to start to move. Mm. Around this time next month, we'll be getting the April inflation numbers mm -hmm. across the region. And mm. at some point, some people will be freaking out mm. if we do get a pickup in inflation. If we currency sees mm. a lot of these oil importers as well, mm -hmm. How do you suggest we look at those numbers when they come out next month? I think actually what you mentioned may have chance to happen. I wouldn't put it as a spike up. I think probably some strongest sequential grain mm -hmm. to, to, to show that the resilience. Most importantly is that what's going on in, on the geopolitical uh, fronts, especially in the Middle East, is putting tension. Mm -hmm. And we see that oil prices is elevated. And, uh, and, uh, uh, and, and edging up. And therefore, there could be some pressure coming from that. And Asia, as uh, most of the countries are importers of oil, we can probably see some of the higher prices uh, from fuels. Uh, and there's some adjustment of utility in some selected economies in the regions that could put pressure on that as well. Mm -hmm. And that, in addition to like a delayed Fed rate cut, I think would also make the uh, Asian central banks to be more uh, uh, measured in yeah. terms of when they kind of probably ease. Yeah. You mentioned China needs to cut. Uh, mm. I'm just wondering, given the, the strong GDP numbers in the first quarter, mm. does, does it diminish the chances of more easing? No, I still think that it needs to cut. You look at the Chinese mortgage rates, you know, if you count it on real basis, it's as high as almost 4% because of the very low inflation at this time. And also, if you look at the very strong GDP, the external demand is the one that's really putting the addition. And we all know that uh, the strategy for China right now is very strong manufacturing and supply chain focus. So the industrial side of the economy is doing well, but the domestic demand side, we see that the consumption progressively actually uh, below expectation and, and weakened, and that's because of the struggling real estate sector. So I think some help actually should be given mm. to address the domestic demand side of the economy. All right, Christian mm. Tantono, mm. thank you so much. Allianz Global Investors, APEC Senior Economist, joining us here in Hong Kong. We also did talk to the Philippine Finance Secretary, Ralph Recto. He's warning of a possible delay in rate cuts if the peso weakens past its record low of 59 against the dollar. But he told us exclusively that the delay should not affect the government's 6 to 7 percent growth goal. For the last 20 years, we've, been, we've had a st relatively stable currency, uh, more or less from 55 since 2004, 55 pesos to one U.S. dollar. Today, it's something like 57. So not that bad as far as the Philippines is concerned. Are you worried about it potentially weakening into the 59 arena? Because 57 really, I think, mm -hmm. was a line in the sand for the Philippines, and mm -hmm. now it feels like it's been pushed to 59. Mm -hmm. That's a possibility. Uh, and that would affect also our ability to reduce interest rates uh, moving forward, I suppose. So if we see the peso weaken past 59, potentially you're going to have to hold off on interest rate reductions. That's right. Wow. That's a big statement. 
potentially how much potentially the, potentially, potentially yeah potentially. but uh, but how it's go impacting all of this that's right do you think because um you know starting where we started with yellen having this meeting with her counterparts from south korea and japan do you think because the united states needs south korea and japan and the philippines similar as partners against china you almost have a little bit more leeway if you wanted to intervene and prop up the currency uh, not so much in so far as against china but they really it's more about economic cooperation between the philippines the u.s uh, japan asean uh, korea um, not so much about propping up the currency but even if we hold off in reducing interest rates we expect the philippine economy to still grow between six to seven percent this year so even if you hold off on reductions. That's right. That's right. Um, what is the growth outlook for the Philippines, though, if we do continuously see a stronger dollar and potentially mm -hmm. the Fed hold mm -hmm. rates into next year, which is what one Fed governor said yesterday? Potentially okay, well, the happen. benefit to the Philippines is that our revenues increase with a higher uh, a foreign exchange U.S. dollar. Uh, second, we have a robust OFW remittances and we have a strong BPO industry. So we earn something like $100 billion, including exports and uh, tourism, uh, roughly in a year. There you go. Philippine Finance Secretary Ralph Recto uh, speaking exclusively with our Anne-Marie Hoarder. Right. Uh, just ahead, China bracing for tougher criticism from the U.S. as its presidential election looms. And we look at why Beijing is so far not taking the bait. That's next. This is Bloomberg. Welcome back to The China Show. Here are some of the geopolitical stories we're following for you this morning. The U.S. and the Philippines are starting their annual joint military drills on Monday. The exercises will be held across multiple Philippine locations. And for the first time since the exercises began three decades ago, troops will sail beyond Philippine waters in a move that risks further heightening tensions with China. More than 16,000 personnel are expected to take part. Meanwhile, Chile has imposed temporary anti-dumping tariffs on Chinese steel products used in the country's mining industry in a bid to support some 20,000 jobs. Chinese steel products will face levies of up to 34 percent over the next six months. An uptake of cheap imports has been pressuring steel producers across Latin America. And the U.S. Trade Representative says she expects a conclusion soon on a review of tariffs on more than $300 billion in Chinese goods. Last week, President Biden threatened higher levies on Chinese steel and aluminum as he seeks to win over union workers ahead of November's election. Catherine Tai told us Biden has kept the Trump-era tariffs in place for leverage with Beijing. There is no such thing as free trade in steel. The market in steel globally is significantly distorted by what we are calling the non-market policies and practices coming out of China. And as far as markets go, some of the most promising stocks, sectors and industries are facing this growing threat of trade restrictions from Western governments, blurring the outlook for the market itself. And, you know, we put out a story on this really, but it just really sums up, you know, the best that perhaps this market has to offer currently yeah. is, is really what's really coming under the shadow here of geopolitics. And you got to wonder what this means. You know, does it mean to more trade wars? You know, and you're going to get more tip for tat. Hmm. Um, but, you know, in terms of the market implications, you know, that's certainly going to impact earnings in some way when you're dealing with a lot of overcapacity yeah. price competition in these spaces, right? We're talking about EVs, clean tech, industrial, high man and manufacturing, all of those which are under the scrutiny of, of U.S. and EU regulators right now. You know, Becky Leo from Stan Charts, the head of China Macro, who was here about an hour ago, right? Uh, she mentioned in one of her answers that you know, almost every single Chinese corporate that they speak to is looking to outside markets for growth currently and yeah. you know, to your point that this affects business and the outlook as well um, how long is that runway currently well I mean, you've seen some decent gains right take a look at you know CATL for example let's jump some 17 percent in China. Mm. Um, Goshen, you take a look at some of these like solar stocks like Longhi though that they've actually underperformed so it, it's yeah. the, in terms of the stock performance it kind of differs right now so you got to wonder what's next what's, yeah. what's the next target going to be well let's uh, let's bring in Rebecca Chung Wilkins to talk us through this of course the US is gearing up for these presidential elections uh, China's looking to resist any sort of temptation to to sort of jump back in Rebecca I'll bring you in here so far Beijing has been has exercised restraint 
hmm. amidst the China bashing that is expected anyway going into elections. Yeah, absolutely. I think, look, from Beijing's point of view, it knows it's going into a very heated U.S. election. It knows it's likely for a long time that it's going to be Biden versus Trump, mm -hmm. the latter, of course, who introduced so many of these initial curbs back during his administration. Biden has only added to these. He has introduced more uh, curbs and restrictions than any other American president. So in some ways, China is dealing with a known quantity. We started already to see some of these signs of restraint right back after the APEC meeting, that Biden comment about Xi being a dictator, for example, we saw a very muted response. So now if we look, for example, uh, at, at this potential plan to triple steel uh, tariffs on the U.S. side, um, you know, there we've seen sort of a little bit of a, this sort of tit for tat or reciprocal approach. China in its turn has said that, it, you know, it's going to raise tariffs on propionic acid, types of industrial acid, but it's a really small sort of pocket of goods that might be affected, about 7 million U.S. Dollars. And in fact, even the U.S. tariffs are a relatively small uh, section of the market, despite sort of Catherine Tai's comments that really the value is under two billion U.S. dollars last year. And so we see on both sides, in fact, actually still a little bit of this sort of um, high fence, small yard approach. And China, of course, we know it is relying on the strong U.S. demand to help support and bring back growth. The reliance on the export model we saw very, very clearly come through when we had that first quarter data and it doesn't really behoove China to inflame the fires here particularly when so much of this is about as they see it US domestic politics okay tariffs could be symbolic as you as you highlight but what if there is some sort of divestment or ban on TikTok in the US we just talked about over the weekend this bill is getting closer into some sort of legislation what would China then do yeah absolutely so I think that's probably one where we know for example the Chinese embassy it was reported had its staff behind the scenes lobbying hard to try and prevent this happening. Now, that bill was looped in, bundled in with that other critical financing bill providing uh, financing for Ukraine and Israel, and that sort of helped fast track it through the weekend. Now, after the House of Representatives, it's going to go to the Senate. It's expected to pass. It's one of these bipartisan issues that actually has uh, support across, you know, across both sides. For China, it's been quite robust in its language. It has previously accused the U.S. of bullying. It's resisted this, this push, and it does have certain things that it could rely on to try and resist it. Um, but even so, the rhetoric has been a little bit more restrained. It might be that they are working much harder sort of to try and change the outcome behind the scenes than wanting to really come out swinging on this issue. Yeah, b behind the scenes is, is important. You know, Yellen was there. And Blinken's going there next week. Blinken is going there, and we're expecting him to raise this issue uh, and, and pressure China into not supporting any efforts that, uh, of Russia's war in Ukraine. That's going to be one of the central issues, according to, to one source who's familiar with, with that plan that's coming up. Um, but I think there is a slightly different divergence that we can see between how Beijing has dealt with these European officials that have come versus the U.S. Mm -hmm. that I would point to. So we saw with that Schultz visit, for example, Beijing really deeply engaged. Li Tiang, Xi Jinping fully giving very robust, very detailed, very concrete re rebuttal to this accusation of overcapacity, this accusation of unfair foreign treatment. That is quite different to the type of rhetor rhetoric and, and more of the sort of standard commentary that we saw in response to the Yellen visit. So we might see more of this sort of diverging, um, diverging approach to how Beijing is dealing with the US versus the European Union. We know Xi also has this European jaunt uh, coming up as well. So we might again see this sort of demonstration, this divergence. Beijing may, of course, feel that the U.S. is sort of a done deal mm -hmm. with the election, with the momentum, the direction of travel is clear, and that perhaps it's only really with its European uh, nations that it might have a little bit more leverage and it might have a little bit more realistic room to negotiate. All right, Rebecca, it's good to have you back. Rebecca Chung Wilkins uh, there uh, on really what's going to be a pretty tricky election year on the U.S. as well. we got plenty more ahead. This is Bloomberg. All right, this is your Asia benchmark here this morning. We're seeing a decent sort of rally across Asian equities here. We're off some of the highs, but we're still seeing gains about 1%. So certainly that looks to be good. It was an interesting weekend, too, when it comes to Shanghai. 
seems like all eyes was just on one racer, really. Yeah, Joe Guan Yu, and I think he came in 17th, <laughs> uh, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, all that being said, as you would expect, of course, it's the one in uh, first time uh, since 2019 on the ground. Uh, local favorite, obviously, uh, goes without saying. Um, Didn't get any points, though. Yeah. Unfortunately. Well, he scored points on social media yeah, at, at the very least, sure. right? Uh, the hashtag uh, Joe Guan Yu cried. Well, we're translating. Joe Guan Yu Kula. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> there we which go. Which is interesting because he talked about this, how emotional he was mm. to be racing, of course, at home. And he said he's only cried twice in the past decade. The first was when he was told he was entering into the F1 three years yeah. ago. The second was basically during this Grand Prix. So I think social media really kind of responded to that. I, I had a friend that was there at just the qualifiers, not yeah. even the real race, and she was telling me that every time his car would pass, yeah. the amount of applause was just like earth shattering. It was just crazy how many people were behind him. I think there were some numbers too, right? Uh, how many people showed up? 60,000 60, 60, fans yeah. each day. He could have just done that alone, really, <laughs> <laughs> right? To generate all that all, all that support, but yeah, at least it's back in Shanghai, right? Um, uh, af after a while, yeah. Um, yeah. Should we leave this here for now? Why not? Okay, um, let's <laughs> pivot back to markets. <laughs> why, why, why not? Why not? Um, copper. Uh, we're looking at that very very closely today. As you can see, pick your contract. Um, Copper in Shanghai, 80,000. LME, 10,000 in play. CMX, 460. Uh, so we're really uh, continuing to push the, I guess, in some ways, the limits, the short-term limits, I guess, of this rally taking place in, in the copper market. Broadly speaking, uh, we're looking at cash markets. I think earlier on, we reversed the, what, uh, up to one point, were modest gains on the, on the CSI 300. So we're now flat on that. Hang Seng, but MSCI China is doing quite well. We're up about 2% in both there. Yeah, I mean, it's really driven by the tech sector. Look at that. We're up 2%, 10 cents up some 4 or 5% here this morning. So certainly there is some optimism ahead of a pretty big week when it comes to big tech in the U.S. as well with NVIDIA, the MAX 7 reporting results, and Dollar China holding steady at that 725 level. That's it for us here on The China Show. This is Bloomberg.